So principles of reform. So the heart of the education reform debate centers around enabling families to have access to a quality education option for their children. Implementing a market dynamic to the education system to offer parents a choice, sometimes called school choice, can bring competition, which tends to generate better quality options, especially for those with specific educational needs or who live in poor performing school districts. It is interesting to note that a majority of families involved in publicly funded parent choice programs come from low-income communities. Meanwhile, Many low-income families see the public school in their community as an important cornerstone that they want to see succeed in a way that helps their children and community flourish. Student First is an education reform organization founded by well-known education reformer and, and former chancellor of D.C. Public School, Michelle Rhee, now part of education advocacy group 50can.org. The group outlined five uh, principles for promoting great, great schools, which can serve as guiding principles for reforming education. So one is transparency. Great schools openly engage their community. Parents deserve high quality, easy to understand information about school performance and finances. Choice. Every child is different. Parents should be able to choose an educational option that meets their child's unique needs. Accountability. Schools should be expected to effectively serve all of their students. When they don't, they must improve. Equity. Every child, regardless of background, zip code, or family income, should be able to attend a great school. And flexibility. Schools and districts must be encouraged to innovate, not held back by needless bureaucratic restrictions. So free market advocates tend to be proponents of parent choice, which empowers parents to choose the school that best fits their children's educational needs, can be especially beneficial to low-income families, and promotes greater equality in access to high-quality equal- education. Public education advocates tend to think that parents' choice aims to dismantle public education and will increase inequality for disadvantaged families. An argument against school choice is outlined in this Salon article. There's a link to it. Perhaps the largest opportunity for reform is to increase parents' choice through child charters, vouchers, education saving accounts, and tax credit scholarships. And following our overviews of these various options. So for charter schools, these are publicly funded, privately run schools, which enroll about 3.1 million students in 43 states. Charter schools have governing bodies, but are not governed by a traditional school board as other public schools are. And included is a video by the 74 that uh, answers eight questions about charter schools. So you can click on that video uh, in the brief. KIPP Academies is also an excellent example of a successful charter school network. Um, And there's another link there to an overview video video of KIPP Academies there. So for vouchers, according to edchoice.org, school vouchers give parents the freedom to choose a private school for their children using all or part of the public funding set aside for their children's education. Under such a program, funds typically spent by a school district would be allocated to a participating family in the form of a voucher to pay partial or full tuition for their child's private school, including both religious and non-religious options. And uh, 15 states and Washington, D.C. have voucher programs. And as far as tax credit scholarships, a similar policy to some of the above is the provision of tax credit scholarships, which allow taxpayers to receive full or partial tax credits when they donate to nonprofits that provide private school scholarships. Eligible taxpayers can include both individuals and businesses. And in some states, scholarship giving nonprofits also provide innovation grants to public schools and or transportation assistance to students choosing alternative public schools. And right now, this program exists in 17 states. And there is a PragerU video included um, where Denisha Merriweather explains how a tax credit scholarship helped her attend school. And I would also mention, if you have not seen the movie Miss Virginia, which is about the, how the D.C. tax scholarship credit uh, program started, it is inspiring. It's a, it's a great watch, um, great for families, and uh, kind of gives a firsthand account of how 
a single mom basically uh, made that happen uh, in, in Washington, D.C. So education savings accounts are a more recent innovation in parent choice programs, and they allow parents to withdraw their children from a public school district or a charter school and to receive a deposit of the public funds into a government-authorized savings account where you have restricted but multiple uses for um, that you can use the money for. So, if, for example, private school tuition or for outside educational services. And there is a video from EdChoice that is included um, here that you can click on and learn more about education savings accounts. And some other ideas for reform include making it easier to hire and reward, and if necessary, fire teachers based on performance and qualifications, um, and creating new pathways for teachers to reach the classrooms. For example, to recognize other types of qualifications um, for them to obtain teaching jobs. Also, making it easier to dismiss poorly performing teachers and re rewarding high performers. Uh, giving principals more flexibility to make these decisions, such as hiring and firing, setting school schedules, et cetera, and exploring very, uh, very teacher compensation models. Another idea for, uh, for reform is to promote the options of dedicated career and technical training high schools and programs in, uh, in high schools, and we talked a little bit about that earlier. Also promoting the use of community-based organizations, which we also talked about, especially in underprivileged neighborhoods, um, as a method for improving student performance. And then also the summer loss programs, um, better early childhood options, and then also better access to online education uh, options, and especially uh, making sure that there are high-speed internet um, access in rural areas, which really, they do have challenges that uh, many of us who live in, in larger areas that we can't contemplate and that we probably take for granted. Yeah, and uh, we are recording this uh, this during a quarantine, and so many schools and children are locked at home and have to uh, go online, and some school districts are really not ready to deliver education uh, through, um, through e-learning, even though there are so many resources available out there. Um, the platforms, people may not have access to the right platforms in order to follow these programs. So that's something that's often not, it's kind of a blind spot in in the um, in a school district and in their planning and the way they allocate their resources to ensure that everyone is up to speed to be able to continue an education from home in case something happens. It might be a health issue, it might be this quarantine situation mm -hmm. that we're in, but it, it should really be part of being able to provide individualized learning uh, to kids. Well, and, and I wonder if a silver lining to this, you know, massive homeschool movement, which we're all a part of now, is is thinking through what are some other options, whether it's delivered through public or private. I think both types of schools are delivering online learning or paper-based remote learning uh, where needed. Uh, but but it's I think more parents through this will will see that children can learn outside of a classroom. And maybe there's a new combination. I don't know what that looks like. I think we're all still making our way through this. But uh, perhaps this is an opportunity where some minds can be opened and and we can see some innovation in that regard. So this is a really substantive brief that covers all of the areas of, uh, of the whole education um, issue from a national level to a very local level. So, so what can you do? Where, where do you start um, wanting to be engaged? You know, starting to discuss this brief allows you to find your, your focus and where you can apply your expertise, your talent, your preoccupation uh, to one specific areas. And um, we, uh, you, can, you can dig into additional resources for or, you know, understanding various reform options in the education system and the way it's run. You, you can focus on um, curriculum in, in your school. And uh, you can also write, engage with your legislators about their views and start a dialogue um, uh, with them about what they're thinking about education uh, in, in your city and in your state. Um, as Beth suggested, attending school board meetings and reviewing the annual budgets um, is really important. You can ask to meet for coffee with a school board member to find out about priorities and share information with them. Uh, you can 
And just a note on that, your school board members in many cases, um, probably most cases, they are volunteers. And so they are usually serving as community members and they are often parents and your neighbor and people. And so getting to know them um, on a one-on-one basis really is a great way to establish rapport um, and then and kind of learn about what their perspectives are. So it's really I think it's in some ways also I think it's important to do both where you can meet them individually as well as attend them, you know, in a collect attend seeing them in a collective meeting um, that there's really value in both. Yeah, it's true that there's really value in building reports. And when we do you do show up with a major issue at a school board meeting, you already know them on a personal basis. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, you know, there's also, you know, volunteering, of course, at, at your school is a great way to learn how the school is run and how decisions are made. And, uh, and then find out if your state offers tax credit or similar scholarship uh, and support them through your business or on a personal basis for to give others uh, the choice of finding a school that fits uh, their kids' learning, um, learning pattern. Uh, you know, you can also find an organization, volunteer as a mentor or volunteer as a tutor. Many organizations, especially in low-income communities, are in need of consistent volunteers. Organizations such as Take Stock and Children in Florida are good examples, and there's also churches and other religious institutions that often know of reputable programs in, in need of help. Um, you can also support an after-school program where you can share your professional talents, uh, such as teaching cooking, chess, home economics, gardening, accounting, um, programming, and meet with a family who chooses private school as an option. Ask their views on public education versus private. Um, we also have developed another policy circle brief on education savings account uh, that is uh, available in our library, and that could be the topic of another. Uh, another Beth, do you have some share on what can you do, and, and perhaps you can share a little bit of what you've done, I know, in, in uh, our area? Sure. So through the group you mentioned at the beginning of the brief, new, brief new turn, uh, of our discussion, New Turn Neighbors, uh, we have shown up at school board meetings and really tried to better understand the budget, how resources are deployed. Uh, we've taken a hard look at curriculum choices that the school has made. And, you know, some are, some are good, some are not good. And have just tried to express views and, and some input uh, to the schools so that they can you don't know what parent concerns are and taxpayer concerns are um, because at the end of the day, they they really do work for us. I mean, if you think about it, they are a public service and they should be responsive that way. And I think we've had, you know, some success. The, um, you know, I think obviously knowing what's going on in your school and you listed quite a few ways that you can do that by volunteering, getting to know people on the school board, um, you know, really taking advantage of, teacher conferences, making sure that you show up when you're, when you have the opportunity, um, to talk about with a teacher about your child. And then as well, um, you know, be in the classroom really helps you understand really the wonderful job that a lot of teachers do. I mean, they really are so many good teachers out there and, um, it's important to understand the many, you know, things that go into creating a great classroom, you know, and what teachers can and can't do. I mean, parents are obviously, you know, if not the biggest influence on a child in their education, and yeah, and I mean, understanding the administrative structure yes. of the school is something that I would never have thought of doing. Um, you know, when when I first started sending my kids to school, I never really had that thought. And but I, it's a really important one to be to be part of that. And there's a number of committees and task force that also involve the community uh, and tackle specific uh topics that uh, you could be a voice in. Mm-hmm. So, you know, maybe we can conclude with um, summarizing here in the brief. There's some uh, thought leaders and additional resources that you could follow. Ed Choice is, is one organization um, that has uh, detailed arguments and data in support of parent choice in schooling. Uh, Michael McShane has a short book. It's called Education and Opportunity, which outlines how a wiser use of technology in a marketplace of education option can help today's students succeed in tomorrow's economy. Uh, Mike Petrilli of the Fordham Institute uh, has Education for Upward Mobility. 
And then Howard Fuller, who designed the first voucher system on Education America, um, we have a video here of Howard Fuller in uh, Milwaukee. There's also economist Roland Fryer, who's a founder and faculty director of the Education Innovation Laboratory at Harvard University, on one why he was drawn to education reform and why accidents of birth should not determine our access to high-quality education. Uh, so there's several projects um, that um, that Dr. Fryer uh, leads. There's also 50can.org is an education reform organization that advocates for the principles of transparency, choice, accountability, equity, and flexibility in our school system. Uh, education Trust is a nonprofit organization that promotes closing opportunity gaps by expanding excellence and equity in education for students of color and those from low-income families from pre-kindergarten through college. Uh, the Foundation for Excellence in Education focuses on personalized learning in addition to choice and accountability. And then there's the American Federation for Children, which uh, its website compiles data on parent choice programs available across various states with an easy to use map. And there's also a Ed Choice publish a dashboard that has a helpful overview of parent choice options um, that can be refined by type and state. So Kellogg Northwestern Factbook on Education provide global and national facts on education. And then, uh, Beth, you were mentioning uh, Miss Virginia, but there's other documentaries. Maybe you can tack on that. Sure. So there's the 2014 documentary called The Ticket that outlines the different ways school choice is developing across the country. And we include a link to the trailer for it. And then, of course, there is the 2010 documentary Waiting for Superman, by award-winning filmmaker Davis Guggenheim, which explores the America's broken education system, and uh, that that's another one I would I would highly recommend. Lots of good information in that. So great. Well, you know, each brief come with a discussion guide, and uh, in which you know you could drive a full discussion and then decide on the how to engage. So with that, I'd like to conclude our podcast today. And Beth, thank you for um, um, doing this with us. And I think this is a really great overview and a starting point. So I encourage you to discuss education K-12 in uh, your circle, whether in enterprise, in your association, in, uh, in your community. So thank you, Beth. Thank you, Sylvie. Thanks for having me.